Hello my beautiful watchers, um, just in case anyone didn't see my last video, I wanted to remind one and all that this episode was written and filmed before the Screen Actors Guild put out a statement asking full-time content creators not to make studio film related content. After this episode I'll be restricting myself exclusively to book related content in solidarity with the writers and actors and their very reasonable demands. Thank you. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome to Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube based review show dedicated to discussing the relationship between films and the books they're based on. This is part 2 of my investigation into the murder of Agatha Christie's books by Sir Kenneth Branagh. If you've not checked out my review of Murder on the Orient Express there's the thing, but the relevant info is despite harbouring an embarrassing and mildly inexplicable affection for these films, I objectively know that the creators made some pretty wild choices adaptation wise that I am fully prepared to call them out for. Despite its mixed reception with critics and audiences, the Murder Train movie evidently did well enough to warrant a sequel, possibly helped along by the vocal support of Christie's great-grandson. Not surprisingly, they chose Dame Agatha's other mad popular installment of the adventures of Hercule Poirot, Death on the Nile. Originally published in 1937, Nile was the 17th novel that Christie wrote about the bombastic Belgium gentleman detective and is considered one of her finest works. All of the previous ringleaders made a return, Branner as the co-producer, director and leading man, Ridley Scott as co-producer and Michael Green as screenwriter. Tom Bateman also reprised his role as Monsieur Book, which is surprising for reasons I'll discuss at length shortly. The new ensemble cast of killers, killed and suspects included Gal Gadot, Emma Mackey, Lolita Wright, Sophie Okonedo, Army Hammer, Annette Benning, Ali Fazal, Russell Brand, Rose Leslie, Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders. This proved to be a somewhat cursed casting between Gal Gadot who took flack for her statements about the war between her home country of Israel and Palestine, Russell Brand coming out as a prominent anti-vaxxer, and Army Hammer being exposed as an abuser and sexual predator with a cannibalism fetish. Big old yikes to that one, though for once it looks like being a complete monster might have actually ended someone's acting career. I have no idea why Hollywood tried so hard for so long to make this spoiled rich kid with no acting talent whatsoever the next big thing. It was almost funny at the time seeing the film's trailers trying to avoid showing Hammer as much as possible. A casting silver lining for me was then bringing on Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders as a twosome as they were one of my favourite British comedy duos in the 90s. Yes I'm old, let's talk adaptation. Poirot beginning his latest adventure, enjoying his celebrity status in a nightclub in London. A young lady called Jacqueline introducing her long-time mega-rich friend Lynette to her new fiancé Simon and asking her to give him a job. Poirot running into the trio sometime later while holidaying in Egypt, only with the slight twist that Simon and Lynette are now married and woman scorned Jacqueline has apparently taken to following them around on their world tour honeymoon to continuously spoil the vibe. Lynette and Simon, knowing Poirot's reputation, appealing to him to talk talk some sense into her or do something about her behaviour. Praro refusing to be officially hired but agreeing to do so out of common decency. Jacqueline being less than receptive to his appeals for reasonable behaviour and showing off that she has a tiny gun that she is strongly considering using on one or both of the newlyweds. Lynette attempting to solve the issue by throwing money at it and booking a boat ride down the Nile for the entire wedding party because apparently the mega rich used to take everyone with them on their honeymoon back in the 20s I guess. I'll go into this in a lot more detail in the next section, but I have to say up front that this time around they played a lot faster and looser with the cast of suspects. There's very few that didn't have some aspects of their personality, occupation, backstory, relationships to each other, gender, motive or general behaviour either swapped around, altered significantly or erased and replaced completely. The only possible survivor of this mass rewriting was Louise, Lynette's French maid, whose possible motive for murder and ultimate grisly fate remained largely intact. They did stick to the important fact that there was a doctor and a nurse on board because they're essential to the plot, and that one of the passengers is a vocal communist for its 
comedy value. Anyways, Pro ending up on the ship with them, and everyone stopping off to have a largely unsupervised wander through Abu Simbel. You know, the crazy ancient Egyptian tombs, because again, that was apparently a thing that rich people could just do back in the day. Someone attempting to flatten Simon and Lynette with a falling boulder like a Looney Tunes assassin, making Jackie's sudden arrival on the boat super sus, but the crew assuring them that she had been on board during the incident. Praro retiring early and falling into what he would later realize was a drug-induced deep sleep. Jackie getting into a drunken fight with Simon around one in the morning, and in a moment of rage popping a cap in his leg. The other passengers scrambling to summon the doctor to help Simon, and the nurse to look after a now suicidally remorseful Jackie. Discovering in the morning that Lynette had been shot in the head sometime during the night, and the most obvious suspect had been in a drug-induced stupor under the constant supervision of the nurse the entire night. Praro doing his Praro thing, where he interviews all of the suspects one by one, managing to offend and annoy each and every one of them. During all this, Simon being surprisingly forgiving of Jackie for shooting him, making excuses for her, and being more than willing to spend time with her. The body of poor Louise being discovered with a wad of blackmail money in her pocket, and another suspect getting shot by a mystery assailant before they can disclose key information, making this one of the higher body count investigations of Praro's career. Praro eventually gathering everyone to announce his conclusions. Outing Lynette's embezzling estate manager as the guy who tried to crush her with a rock, something he did in a moment of panic and deeply regretted. And revealing her murderers to be Simon and Lynette working as a team, having faked the first bullet in the shin so he could leg it down the boat and kill his bride while everyone was distracted looking after Jackie. Louise having witnessed a key part of this and used subtle code words to convey this to Simon during a joint interview for blackmail purposes. Simon having passed this information on to Jackie so she could steal a scalpel from the doctor's bag and join the murderers club, then add a second body to her count when the other passenger was about to reveal she'd seen who the maid was with right before she died. Jackie electing to kill herself and Simon rather than face a lengthy trial and probable execution. As you can see, they reeled in Praro's mustache to a slightly less hilarious size. I'm really not sure if I'm relieved or disappointed. They kept to a lot of the key points of the investigation, like realizing who Lynette's coded hints must have been directed towards and the discovery of the shawl that Simon wrapped around the gun to muffle when he actually did take a bullet in the leg. Which brings up a potential plot hole that's been driving me mad since I read this book that maybe you guys can help me out with. Praro figured out there must have been a third bullet fired because the shawl had been used to muffle a shot, but the powder residue on Lynette's head proved that the shot that killed her wasn't muffled. So why did no one hear the shot that killed Lynette? He just put the gun to her head and fired, and this didn't wake anyone up or alert the people running up and down the ship. If a little caliber gun is quiet enough that no one could hear it being fired at one end of the boat, why did Simon have to wrap it up in fabric when he fired it on the other end? I, I guess I'm just curious to know if you guys also think this is a plot hole or if I've missed something here. Anyways, um, I was pleased that they stuck to the visit to Abu Simbel because say what you like about Branagh's choices in this or any other film, the man is exceptionally good at making landscapes look really pretty, and I was excited to see this part of Egypt shot in his style. Oh, yes, Monsieur Branner, give me that landscape porn. Oh. The film starts with a little creative storytelling that has zero connection to Agatha Christie's Prow lore, a black and white flashback to World War I, and a digitally de-aged Kenneth Branner Prow using his inductive reasoning skills to help his squad of men capture what was assumed to be a virtually impregnable bridge, but being badly wounded right afterwards in a booby trap explosion that kills his excessively mustached captain. We then get a cameo from Catherine, the soon-to-be-deceased lover referenced in the last movie, played by Susanna Fielding, who is unprotected perturbed by Prowo's face-altering injuries, calmly suggesting that he grow a moustache to cover it. This kind of undercuts the tragedy of this flashback because it inadvertently frames the entire sequence as the origin story of Prowo's moustache. Just let that sink in. This moustache has a tragic backstory. It's a shield covering his emotional and literal scars that he symbolically shaves off at the end to show that he's finally ready to let go and try to 
move on from the untimely death of his intended decades later. I'm sure we're all used to prequels that feel the need to hyper-explain the origins of every single thing about a popular character, but the gravitas these films place on this man's facial hair is still very impressive. Clearly nothing was learned from the first installment because Prero suffers from all the same issues in this film. They still play up him having OCD for laughs, and he's even more of an action star than before, wrangling snakes with his lightning reflexes, chasing down mysterious armed figures, throwing knives like a frickin' ninja, and getting into a Mexican standoff with the killers at the end. As I said in the last video, for a character that was specifically created to be a non-violent intellectual, he sure does seem willing and able to transition into being Batman when the need arises. Putting Prero on pause for just a second, what the heck is Book doing here? Apparently the least Book accurate character in the last film was so popular they decided to crowbar him into a story that he wasn't in at all, and devote a not insignificant amount of the runtime to a sub-arc about him trying to get his stuck-up mother's approval for him to marry a jazz musician's manager. This leads to my least favourite moment for film Prowro, the reveal that he was secretly working for Book's mama this whole time, evaluating if the young woman of colour was good enough to date her son. This level of betrayal of trust in his friendships and willingness to partake in a case that he would surely have found distasteful is frankly disrespectful to Book Prowro and wildly out of character for film Prowro, so I have no idea what they were thinking here. You could possibly try to justify his actions by assuming that he was hoping his seal of approval would help smooth things over with Book's mother, but if that is the case, I don't think it was effectively conveyed in the film. Aside from him being, you know, funny, the only advantage to Book's presence in the film is it lends a lot more emotional weight to the story when he's killed to stop him from talking, compared to some random old woman that Prow only just met, but I don't think it was worth it for the amount of drag his presence adds to the plot overall. Lynette's biggest deviation from the book is she was a 20-year-old British girl, and she's being played by a 38-year-old woman with a Middle Eastern accent. This doesn't impact the plot over much, but there is a line that I think was omitted from the film because it was just too quintessential rich white westerner to be assigned to anyone who doesn't fit that exact description. As I mentioned before, so many supporting characters have attributes switched between them or changed completely, it really is hard to know where to start explaining it, so I, I guess I'll just burn through a few of them as quickly as possible. Marie Van Schuyler, the former rich woman who donated her fortune to the Communist Party and was secretly in a long-term lesbian relationship with her nurse, was originally a spoiled, obnoxious old money snob who obsessively tried to control her relatives and bully her employees. These character traits were switched to Euphemia Book, and Marie was given the backstory of a completely different character called Mr. Ferguson, who was also a communist, but way more of a dick about his beliefs, starting condescending arguments continuously throughout the book with anyone he perceived to be part of the capitalist bourgeoisie. Amusingly, he eventually decided he really had to marry Miss Van Schuyler's niece Cornelia, despite having been and continuing to be a complete dick to her, apparently under the delusion that he could debate her into agreeing to marry him, and ignoring her repeated assurances that she hated his guts. Despite not liking him, Pro is equally annoyed at Van Schuyler's aristocratic elitism, so drops the bombshell on her that Ferguson is secretly an English lord who simply chooses not to advertise his title because of his socialist beliefs, short-circuiting her brain because that technically made Ferguson her social better in her mind. BT dubs don't worry, Cornelia runs off with a completely different character at the end, enraging both him and her aunt. Dr. Linus Whittlesham is a combination of two people from the book. Lord Charles Whittlesham, who at one point was engaged to Lynette before she decided she wanted Simon, and only appears in the very start of the book and never made it to Egypt, and a European doctor called Besner, who was on the death boat, but was probably one of the least implicated suspects. They reassigned the secretly a Lord plot twist from Mr. Ferguson to him, but it lacks all of the irony of that reveal because he's not an outspoken communist or trying to court a snob's niece. Being an aristocrat makes no difference to the story in this context. Salome Otterborn, depicted in the film as a sassy, famous jazz singer, was not only an old white lady in the book, she may well have been a self-deprecating author insert, as she was a washed-up, alcoholic mystery writer who had relied too heavily on pulpy plots and sexy murders and had lost the interest of her audience, something that never actually happened to Dame Agatha but I'm sure was on her mind a lot. The jazz singer angle is a entirely film-only 
condition, and the manner of her intended death was reassigned to poor books, so really the only thing she has in common with the book character is her name. Rosalie Otterborn, Salome's niece and business manager and book's love interest, was originally her long-suffering daughter, whose full-time job consisted of trying to keep her mother off the source. I won't list all of the other examples, but you see what I mean about the supporting cast being mixed and matched versions of the book characters? On top of that, there were also a few passengers on the boat that they just cut out altogether. One of Lynette's lawyers was supposed to be present as part of a behind-the-scenes power struggle between his firm and Lynette's estate manager. There was also a recurring character of the series, a retired British Army colonel now working for MI5 called Race. He was on the hunt for an arms dealer who Prarrow off-handedly reveals to him at the end of the book. As a British Secret Service agent, he was the closest thing there was to law enforcement on board, and his borrowed authority is why all the rich assholes grudgingly allowed Prarrow to question them about the murder. Okay, getting out of the weeds for a bit, there's an overview issue with this adaptation I wish to highlight. One of the great things about Dame Agatha's Prarrow cases was there was almost always some major thing that made the investigation incredibly complicated for her lead. For example, and spoiler warning, in her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, the killer was trying to get away with his crime by taking advantage of a British double jeopardy law that stated he couldn't be prosecuted for the same crime twice. So, he had framed himself for his own crime in a way that would reveal his supposed innocence and make him then unarrestable on a technicality from then on. So, Prowro was having to fight to stop him from getting arrested when he looked really guilty, so he could be arrested later for what he was guilty of. And obviously in The Murder on the Orient Express, the big confusing factor was everyone was guilty, which no normal investigator would ever consider. And now I finally come to my rambly point. In Death on the Nile, Prowro was having to deal with the fact that everyone on the boat was guilty of something. Not murder, but something they were desperate to hide. They were all either an embezzler, or an undercover arms dealer, or a professional thief, or a clinical kleptomaniac, or a relapsing alcoholic, or trying to blackmail someone, so as a result, Prowro had to solve half a dozen mini-cases before he could unmuddy the waters enough to prove which one of them had committed murder. This unique selling point of Death on the Nile isn't, in my opinion, carried over into the film, because they only stuck to about half of the mini-crimes. A good deal of the cast are entirely blameless, and Prowro figuring out these misdemeanors was played down in favour of the family drama involving Book's love life. Oh, and while I'm ranting, the public fornication dance scene that I'm assured by my dance enthusiast friends isn't period accurate, and goes on way too long, presumably due to the misapprehension that the audience would be captivated by it, is a film original along with Gal Gadot doing whatever this is. My best guess is it's a subtle commentary on the weird shit that British people do abroad. To end on a lighter note, I was amused that this film chose to undo the setup of the last by having an extra yell at Pro while he's in London about him having successfully solved the case in Egypt, meaning the death on the Nile they mentioned at the end of Murder on the Orient Express was a completely unrelated death on the Nile to this death on the Nile, and Pro returned to England after completing the investigation, then a very short while later returned turn to the Nile to spy on a jazz troupe. It's really no wonder that all of Film Pro's cases so far have taken place on modes of transport. This guy is never not globetrotting. Final thoughts. To Branner and his crew's credit, regardless of whatever else they perceived as fair game to play around with, they did seem to consider the motive and method of a book's murder sacred and made a real effort to adapt it as loyally as possible. And that does count for something. However, they did go a little far this time regarding literally everything else. The lack of a everybody's hiding their own personal crime arc, combined with so much emphasis being placed on Book and his family, removed a lot of the soul of the book story. All in all, I'd say this film is about as far as you could conceivably push Death on the Nile without it becoming an adaptation in name only, and whether or not you enjoy it will depend a lot more on if you like Branner's directing and performance than if you liked the book it's based on. Looking to the future, I'm sure many of you are aware that Branner is making at at least one more film in this series, and apparently it's horror-themed. You would be forgiven for not even realising that A Haunting in Venice is a Praro film, as they seem to be going for a very different vibe to its predecessors, and the man himself only pops up right at the end of the trailer, sporting an even smaller moustache. It appears that Branner's decided that making all of the best-known Praro stories his own isn't the move anymore, so he has gone way down the list to one of Christie's lesser-known and comparatively lukewarmly received novels that she wrote very late in her career, and he's not even 
sticking to the original title. Time will tell if this pays off for him reception-wise and angry Agatha Christie fan-wise. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. I shall leave you with the usual reminder that all YouTube channels exist at the whims of the unforgiving algorithm, and the only way to stay in its good books is to offer it a never-ending stream of likes, comments, and new subscribers. So, if you enjoyed this video, please don't hold back on any or all of those things. Much love. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, April Mack, and Curtis Charles Jr. Shout out to Il Nedge for the credits music, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's editor, Sophia Ricciardi, links to her work in the video description. Alright, stick you on the cat tower. Hey everyone, this is Weef, if you've not met him yet. He's my little voidling. How's my hair looking? Ah, who am I kidding? It's always gorgeous.